It takes a lot of people to, to be in mission and ministry here at the church, and all that we do Sunday morning is no different than that. We'll be honoring the greeters afterwards in the, in the parlor. We have volunteers who make sure that the sound works, uh, that they have done the, uh, the announcements, the ushers, everyone. And it, it just takes an army of people. And we certainly experienced that this week. We uh, hosted Stand Down for the third time uh, this year. And we had people coming in even before 9 o'clock Thursday morning setting up for Stand Down. And they were back here at 4.30 in the morning to get ready to serve the homeless veterans. And we had people in here until 2 or 3 o'clock with that. And then our custodian, Eddie, flipped the... Uh, flipped the activity center and got ready for the production of On Golden Pond and the United Methodist Women Dinner, did the same thing then on Saturday and then late last night and early this morning flipped the activity center back into a worship area for our contemporary service. Now, Eddie is not a volunteer. He is paid staff, but he has gone above and beyond. And if you see him this morning, thank him because I know he is exhausted but I want you to understand how important it is for us to be in mission and ministry. It takes each and every one of us, and I am just so proud of you. You saw the reading program that's about to start at Lincoln for the summer, the day in the park where we, where we uh, encourage the entire neighborhood to come out, and um, we just are so, so blessed to be able to do that for our neighbors. We confess that in our prayer of pardon. We have not heard the cry of the needy. We have not loved our neighbor. We do. We do. I want to share with you a scripture for today. I, I uh, read it this morning in the first service. It's from the first chapter of Joshua, verse 9. And Clifford Laura, who many of you know, he is, uh, he is here every Sunday morning, uh, ushering in the early service, and he shared with me that this was his wife's favorite scripture, and he said he just, he just says it over and over to himself, and so I was so grateful that Cliff shared that with me. So I want to share with you the words that are written here. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This, my friends, is the word of God for all the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we often find ourselves more willing to be safe than to be bold. And we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would let these words from Joshua become a part of who we are. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The real focus of our worship together today is the table of grace that is set up here. And we will be sharing, with, sharing in that with each other in just a few moments. But I do want to point out to you and remind you that, that every communion Sunday, not only do we consecrate the elements we receive, but we consecrate elements that are in these baskets. And our Stephen ministers will then take them to people who are unable to be in worship with us. And we do ask if you have anyone or know of anyone who would like to receive communion, let us know so we can serve them as well and remind them that, that our worshiping congregation goes beyond what the, what the people who are here on this day. But as we come together to consider the scripture that we hear from Joshua, I pray that you would, you would hear that with this table of grace in mind because this is where boldness comes from. This is where we step beyond the limitations of what we can do on our own. We've been looking at a fun sermon series over the past few weeks, Lessons from Fortune Cookies. We actually gathered up little pieces of paper that came from real fortune cookies, and we've been looking at them because there are, there are some pretty powerful messages in these little fortune cookies. And so today we're going to look at one that we found that said, The greatest risk is taking no risk at all. And I think that that is a really compelling one for us because 
I don't know about you, but I like to I like to make sure I know where I'm going and how I'm going to get there. And taking risks sometimes doesn't fit into my equation. We look for that safety net. We don't want to step outside of the box. We have two lovely dogs. They're really our second set of children. And they have crates. And in those crates are these, are these very cushy dog beds. Now, I figure that those dog beds cost more per square inch than the mattress we have in our bedroom. But it's really interesting to see those dogs when, when they feel like they need to be protected, when they need to be safe. They will take themselves voluntarily to their crates. And they'll stay there until they feel like that it's safe enough to, to put a paw outside of the, outside of the crate. And I think that that is how we live our lives so much of the time. And it's not certainly borne out when we began to consider what is going on in our scripture. Now we know that at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses has died. And after Moses' death, all eyes turned to Joshua. Joshua, God's second in command and the one who had, been, who had been observing how Moses led the people throughout all of these years. But now he's in charge. And it's interesting when you look at that first chapter of Joshua, what is really happening is that God is commissioning Joshua for his ministry to take the people into the promised land. And if you really examine it closely, these are actually words that were used in ancient coronations in the ancient Near East. But Joshua, in just about three different verses, hears the same words. Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, for I am with you. And you've got to think, if you put yourself in Joshua's feet, do not be terrified looking out over the promised land. Okay, yeah, whatever you say, God. But Joshua takes this commissioning to heart as he begins to lead the people into what looks like is going to be sure and complete destruction. The greatest risk is taking no risk at all. A few years ago, there was a country and western song that shot up to the top of the charts. Tim McGraw wrote a song about his father's struggle with a terrible diagnosis. And in this song, Live Like You Were Dying, Tim McGraw takes a lesson from his father's book and he begins to say we should live every day like it's our last day. We should live like we are dying. We should take the risks and it plays back into this fortune cookie slip of paper. The greatest risk is taking no risk at all. And so as we look at our own lives, what's the greatest risk we are taking? Are we living like we are dying? And if the greatest risk is taking no risk at all, how does that equate into our calling? This silly little poem might help you understand what that looks like. There was a very cautious man who never laughed or played. He never risked, he never tried, he never sang or prayed. And when he one day passed away, his insurance was denied. For since he never really lived, they claimed he never died. You get the point? Whenever we are unwilling to step outside of the box, whenever we are willing to just stand still, here is what happens. Inertia is a very, very powerful force, and we find ourselves just stuck in one place, and the grass begins to grow up over our feet, and and we find ourselves helpless and hopeless and not being able to move beyond where we were. The Israelites had had a really, really tough time. They had not listened to Moses. 
all the time. And Moses had not listened to God all the time. And what happened is that they wound up as they tried to, to play it safe and to make things happen the way they wanted them to happen. They wound up wandering in the desert for a very, very long time. And when we find ourselves in a desert, we can feel that same sense of helplessness and hopelessness that surely they must have felt. And we don't know how we can take a risk. We don't want to take a risk. We don't want to live like we were dying. We just stand still. And inertia takes over. And we do not live out our bold faith. We want to stay inside the box. And we don't want there to be any risk at all associated with it. When taking a risk becomes no risk at all, we are not living like we are dying. But if we take a risk and step out what does that look like in our lives well I will tell you I am terrified of heights and it's not just uh, normal heights at all I am fine in an airplane I am fine in uh, you know, standing on top of a mountain, I am fine on top of a bridge, but here is what kind of height terrifies me. It's when I can stand and look down at how far it is I have to fall that I become absolutely paralyzed in fear. A number of years ago in what I call my former life, I had uh, regular business trips to New York City. And one of the things that we always did with our clients in New York City is that we took them to that iconic restaurant on top of the World Trade Center before tragedy hit on 9-11, Windows on the World. And many of you probably had been there, but here is what I would do. I could not stand to look out that window and look down on the city at all. It was so high up. I remember one time we were there that a thunderstorm was passing below us, and it was clear up where we were. Well, I would always want to be in that chair that its back was to the window so I wouldn't have to see it. And I would, I would use the excuse, to, oh, you guys, you need to see how lovely this view is as I absolutely put my blinders on and wouldn't look beyond it. I'm the same way if we're driving on a, on a mountain road. I don't want to look down into the canyon the way my husband does as he's supposed to be driving and making sure we're safe. I want to be facing the wall of mountain that, that is next to us because I feel safe and secure. I feel that way going up Mount Scott. But there is one person in this world that apparently that does not bother them at all, Nick Walinda. Do you know who I'm talking about? He likes to walk across things blindfolded on a tightrope like Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, outside of Sears Tower. This last Friday, his latest feat was to walk on the Orlando Eye, a gigantic Ferris wheel that is in Orlando. And he walked across the top of that Orlando Eye as the Ferris wheel was turning towards him. I was terrified. I could not even stay in the same room with the news broadcast. I was so worried that he was going to fall. And I was really worried because I'd already written that into my sermon, and I told Tabitha if he fell, I would have to change my sermon. But he made it across, and they were uh, interviewing him afterwards, and, you know, the logical question was, how do you do this? How are you able to, to walk across these, these things? And he said, you know, this is what I do. I stay focused, and I take one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. A church posted on its Facebook page this week, I want to stand as close to the edge as I can without going over. Out on the edge you see all kinds of things you can't see from the center. I love that. 
if you stay back at the center, you can't see where it is that you can go. But as we begin to understand that that God is calling us forward, we move out from the center and we stand on the edge because the greatest risk is not taking any risk at all. But if we can put one foot in front of the other, we will begin to live out the call on our lives that God has for each of us. That's exactly what was going on in, in this first chapter of Joshua. Man, they knew that they were outnumbered. They knew that it made no sense to go into this promised land regardless of what God had said to them. But God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous over and over and over again. And he tells, he tells Joshua, I will be with you like I was with Moses. And here's the most interesting part of this. When you look at the last part of that verse... God is with you wherever you go. In the original language, in the Hebrew, that is yalak. And what that literally means is wherever you place your foot, God is there. So he was saying, when you place your foot on the path, I am there. My yalak is there. When you place your foot on the next path, part of the road. I am there. Be strong and courageous and step out from the center. The greatest risk is taking no risk at all. Are you living like you are dying? And then what happens if we don't take those risks? I think we wind up with a life of regrets. And the three saddest words that anyone can ever utter are, if only I. The same thing happens to churches when they don't step outside of the box and follow God's call. The regret that they say, if only we, if only we had started that ministry. If only we had taken that risk. If only we had loved everyone. And the regret becomes the overshadowing statement and description of our lives. Are you living like you were dying? The greatest risk is taking no risk at all. As you come to this table of grace, I pray that you would recognize that it is here that we receive this boldness. It is here where we truly understand that God is saying to each of us, Yalak, wherever you put your foot, there I am. When you come and receive these sacraments, may you also receive the assurance and the very depth of your soul. God is with you. There's no place you can go that God is not already there. May you take the next step and the next step and the next step and move away from the center out on the edge. The words spoken to Joshua and are spoken to us. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the word of God. Let those with ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, for it's in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.